today's video, we're going to talk about the challenges that come with owning properties in a corporation, especially when it comes to the mortgage financing, the tax and legal perspectives. Many times what's ideal for one is not ideal for the other. So it's important to get a good balance. I will also talk about the two best scenarios where it really makes sense to incorporate a real estate purchase. And one of the critical mistakes that I've made in my own investing when it comes to owning a property in a corporation. Hope you enjoy. Now, before we get started, I am not a mortgage professional, a tax or legal expert. I'm simply a real estate investor. And what I'm sharing is the culmination of the experiences that I've learned from investing in real estate uh, through multiple corporations. First, let's look at the legal perspective. When it comes to owning a property in a corporation, the whole point of it from a legal perspective is to keep that property separate from you personally. So the property is owned in a corporation, the rents are received by the corporation, and technically all the liability that may arise from running the operations of that rental property should be contained to that corporation. So if there's a lawsuit or some issue arising from that property in the corporation, it should only be contained to the assets that are held in that corporation, meaning the equity in that property, any cash in the cash bank account, but separate from your personal assets like your home or your own savings. This was actually the reason why I incorporated my first rental property. I was buying a six bedroom student rental and we, the advice we received from our lawyer was that we're going to have six students living in the same home and you want to separate that from our personal name so that any liability that may arise is just contained to that corporation. While this was sound legal advice, in hindsight, it actually didn't make sense for me because I was basically putting every dollar I had into this real estate purchase. And once I purchased this home, I would have pretty much no savings or other assets in my name. I didn't own a home at that time. So in hindsight, this was not quite the best advice for me from a holistic perspective, but from a legal perspective, it was sound to keep the liability in that corporation. Next, let's talk about the financing when it comes to purchasing a property in a corporation. Generally speaking, it is much tougher to get mortgages for properties that you hold in a corporation. There's much fewer banks willing to lend on properties in a corporation. And most of the time, you can't actually work with mortgage brokers on these type of transactions. You need to have a bank rep at one of the banks that allow you to purchase in corporations. And you also need to find the right mortgage rep at these banks that understand the programs that that bank offers, because sometimes you'll have a bank that offers some of the best options when it comes to corporate purchases. And most of the mortgage reps in that bank may not actually know that it exists. You need to find an investor focused mortgage agent at each of these banks to be able to get access to those kind of financing options. Now, a workaround to this is to use what's called a trust agreement. A trust agreement is a document that basically gives beneficial ownership of the property that you're purchasing in your name to the company that you own. So on the closing day, the property goes into your name on title. However, as soon as that happens, the beneficial ownership goes to this corporation. So all the tax filings, all the lease agreements, rental uh, receipts, everything is done through the company you still remain on title. So it's not a perfect separation of the property and yourself. However, for all intents and purposes, the company is the beneficial owner of that property. The benefit of this structure is that now you have access to any mortgage uh, broker and any lender that will lend to you personally. So it opens up the options you have in terms of your financing. Finally, let's look at the tax implications of purchasing a property through a corporation. A common myth that's out there is that when you buy a property in a corporation, you pay less tax. What I found from my experience is most of the time that is not the case. The reason for this is that real estate income, so rental income, is considered passive income within a company. And here in Ontario, passive income is taxed at the highest tax bracket. It does not qualify for the small business deduction for active income, which allows you to pay the low 12.2% tax uh, when you earn active income inside a company. So it does not qualify for the 12.2% and you end up typically paying 53% taxes on any profit you make from a rental property in a corporation. Now, the only real scenario that I've found where it makes sense to incorporate 
a real estate purchase from a tax perspective is if you are already a incorporated small business owner or a incorporated professional like a lawyer, a realtor, a mortgage broker, and you have profits, retained earnings in your company that you've already paid the 12.2% small business tax on and it's sitting in your corporate bank account. That is a time where it makes sense to open up maybe a holding company to buy your real estate uh, purchase and transfer the money from your active business to this holding company to then purchase real estate. This does not reduce any future taxes you pay on the income produced by the rental property. However, that initial down payment was only taxed 12.2%, so it makes it easier to save up the down payment for that purchase. Again, this only applies if you already have a small business or if you're already an incorporated professional. If you're a salaried employee, it does not make sense. The next scenario it makes sense to incorporate is when you're doing joint ventures. In this example, you have a partner who qualifies for the mortgage, goes on title, and maybe comes up with half of the down payment. You would then create a joint venture agreement between yourself and your partner, except that you would make a company the owner of your 50% stake of this joint venture partnership. The reason for this is if you own a joint venture in your personal name, when it comes to your tax filing, it shows up as a rental property that you own. I found that many banks, even if you're not on title and you're not on the mortgage, if they see a rental property where you're declaring taxes on, they will consider the mortgage payment and count that as if you had the mortgage on it. And some of the stricter banks will look at the income you receive, so for example, 50% of the net income, and they will count 100% of the debt payments that show up in that tax filing. And what I found is it dramatically reduces your ability to then purchase rental properties on your own moving forward. So it's a very nasty situation if you have a couple rental properties with different partners and you're now trying to get a property by yourself, you may find that you may not qualify even though you have a good income and you have no rental properties in your own name on title. By creating one corporation that becomes the joint venture to all your partners, all of the profits from any of these joint ventures are then directed to this corporation. You do the tax filing in the corporation on your T1 general tax filing, nothing shows up. Now, the one mistake that I've made when it comes to corporations is I have a partnership where we incorporated a company in which we are all shareholders of, and this company then bought the, the properties that we own together. The reason this was a mistake is now, if any of us want to leave the partnership, it, we have to sell our shares to the other partners who are involved or sell it to a third party, whatever the case. What ends up happening is that this is now a share sale and not a sale of the underlying properties in the corporation that have gone up a lot in value. So there's a capital gains tax that will be uh, applicable when selling this property. This actually creates double taxation because if you imagine, if I sell my partners, my shares, round numbers, for example, for $100,000, They've paid me in cash 100,000 to get my portion. I will now need to pay capital gains tax on that 100,000 because it's more than what I initially contributed into this partnership. So they've now paid $100,000 for shares to own a larger stake of the property. If the property went up in value, say from 400,000 to 600,000, there's a 200,000 capital gain. Now they've paid me 100,000 However, if and when they sell this property, they need to still pay capital gains tax on the full 200,000 increase of the value of this property. So it creates double taxation. The workaround in this scenario is that instead of paying me 100,000, they may only pay me 80,000 for my 100,000 stake in the property because they now take on the future tax liability. So I end up losing money because the 80,000 I get, I still need to pay capital gains tax on my portion. Anyways, all in all, this creates double taxation and I would highly avoid it unless you're purchasing like a massive, you know, apartment building or something where the numbers are significant. When you're dealing with a, a single family rental, a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, I would highly avoid owning a company and being shareholders with partners. 
I hope you found this helpful. This was my perspective on the tax, legal, and uh, mortgage financing perspectives when it comes to owning a property in a corporation. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. Uh, if you like this type of video, give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. I'll be posting more videos like this for you to enjoy. All the best.